We can have a seat to anchor community. So glad to be with you. My name is Brian. I'm one of the pastors on this team. And I'm so glad to be on this team. We are, we're in this third week of this pinched series where we're talking about some relevant stuff. There's this finding peace when money is tight and things are uncertain. Does that feel like life right now? Uh, and last week, man, John just did such a great job. Didn't he do a great job? Those of us that were with him, man. He just was bringing that budget info, you know, and like I remember Candace, my wife and I, we were like sitting there listening to her like, we got to kind of like dial in on our budget again. Jeez, we're feeling a little of that sting, you know, so hopefully that was an encouragement to you. And uh, but we're continuing the teaching series and today we're talking about envy and comparison. So, of course, I have to take you all the way back to elementary school, all the way back to elementary school where I met this kid named Justin. <laughs> Justin was the cool kid. Do you have an image in your head now of, of who Justin is? Justin was the cool kid. We both were on uh, the Cardinals baseball team, uh, not the St. Louis Cardinals. I know you're probably thinking, surprise, I thought you were that much of a prodigy, elementary school player playing for the St. Louis Cardinals. No, not quite. Um, the Kirkland Cardinals, different team. Uh, still the Cardinals though, still the Cardinals claim that. And um, Justin's dad was the coach. And like, this is a critical point because you know, like at this age, it was still cool to have dad as the coach. I don't know what age, like it's not cool to have dad as the coach, but I know it's a thing, you know? And um, so anyways, this was still kind of in that realm of cool equals dad as coach. And Justin was like the best player on the team. So good that he got his own chant when he was at bat. I mean, there's a, there's a certain level of goodness, you know, and, and like he had, uh, like when he was at bat, like his, his last name rhymed with orbit. And so we would just shout out, come on Corbett, hit into orbit, you know, over and over again. And I remember as I was clapping and yelling that out as he was at bat, kind of wanting my own chant, you know, <laughs> like... But I recognized at that early age, Halford E doesn't rhyme with much, you know? I'm like, I was like, you know, dad, you know, I was thinking maybe we'd get a different name like Bingle. Come on, Bingle, you can hit a single. You know, I would take that. Or Gripple, you know, come on, Gripple. Brian Gripple, I don't know how that sounds, but I'd take it, you know, you can hit a triple, you know? And, but I had none of those last names. I had Halford E. Come on, Halford E. No, I won't even try. But so he had his own chant. And I remember, um, you know, one time going home from a game, my dad, my dad's like, that Justin kid, pretty cool kid, huh? And I'm like, dad, I come, like, what about me? Come on, am I cool too? You know, don't worry, all those wounds have been taken care of. Everything is fine. Um, and then so fast forward to high school and, uh, you know, there is this girl named Lauren that I had a, cr a crush on. Now this is pre-Jesus and pre-Candace, so make with it as you will. But through some fate of history, you know, some, some accident, uh, I ended up kissing Lauren one time. Now, um, it was not in the dark. She knew that she was kissing me. And, um, and I, it, it, was, it was both parties were interested, at, this, at least at this particular moment. And for the next few days, I was riding high. I was, things, were, things were looking good for Brian. The stock was up, you know, everything was up and to the right. Lauren and Brian kissed. Maybe you had heard if you're there. And then, but something happened. I don't know what point she, when we were talking on the phone, she started asking me questions about Justin. She goes, hey, tell me about, tell me about Justin. And I'm like, ah, he's doing it again. Justin, you know. And sure enough, I could tell that we were going to be star-crossed lovers, so Lauren and I. Um, and then the last, the last little bit, I remember I was a new Jesus follower and I was uh, at Young Life and Young Life, if you're unfamiliar, is this ministry that helps introduce uh, people, young life, uh, teens uh, to, to Jesus and the teachings of Jesus. Um, and my Young Life leader's like, hey, Brian, you think you can get Justin to start coming to Young Life? And I'm like, Justin, <laughs> Justin, Justin. Uh, well, and that was the last time I've ever dealt with envy. Ever since then, I've been totally fine. <laughs> Never dealt with it. It's crazy, you know, just all done. Not, never. Candace and I were talking, my wife, we were talking in advance of this. She was like, what are, you, what's on the, what's, what are you talking about next week? John did such a good job. You sure you're up for it? Maybe just, you know. And I was like, I was like well, envy, you know. And, um, and she goes, what do you think you envy, you know, you wrestle with? And, 
And we were talking about all the different things you can envy, right? There's, you have en envy for, comparison for, there's relationships, there's athletic ability, there's intellectual ability, there's, there's looks and beauty, there's you know, financial gain level, there's, there's all sorts of things that we compare ourselves with. We, we, we find ourselves envying. You know, it's like even when times are tight, like they are for many of us right now, like we find ourselves still feeling this envy to like buy things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't know. Like envy makes us do the craziest things. And um, like I said, it shows up at certain ages and affects, in, you know, shows up in, in different income brackets. And, and right now with social media, I don't know, have you heard of social media before? Have you ever heard of social media? With social media, like it seems like, you know, it's like, it's this device, this tool that is like really perfect for envy. It's just like, here's this image um, of this person. You don't get to see any of their backstory. You know, you don't get to see, you know, there's all these relationships and in, in stri in strife in their life. You just get to see this beautifully glossed picture of a person by a palm tree with a drink. And you, and that's, it's like perfect. Lee skipped and sculpted to cultivate envy in us. So we're not just trying to keep up with the Joneses anymore. We're trying to keep up with the Kardashians. So I, I invite you guys, I invite you. You know, I don't know the Joneses and I don't really care about the Kardashians. Join me in that journey. So we're looking at the envy and I just want to point out like right at the top what envy is. Like what is the root of envy? You might re remember this. This is going to be helpful for us. Envy is the comparison between yourself and another person. And envy always reaches the conclusion that I am not enough. Envy always reaches the conclusion that I am not enough, and the second part's important, and whatever they have is what I need to become enough. Let me just tell you, spoiler alert, it's a lie. It's a lie. So we're going to be looking at uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 4 through 12. We're going to be going through it verse by verse. If you have a Bible, you can open to it, paper, app, whatever. It's also going to be up on the screen as we go through the teaching. Um, and our first point um, is uh, comparison never delivers. I have a confession to make. Um, every time a pastor says that on stage, it makes some people nervous. <laughs> so, and I have this sick delight in making people nervous. So, I, but don't worry. Um, I, I use Uber Eats uh, more than I probably should. All right? It would be very easy for me to go to the store, but there's this certain satisfaction I have in just hitting a button and waiting for the food to be dropped off on my doorstep. You know, I just hit doorstep drop. You know, I'm like, I don't, I don't need to, I don't need a new friend. You know, I just need to just put the food there and we good. You know, put the food there. And we could, but there's this thing like every once in a while it happens where like if you're you know like me and you bring out the phone and you're wanting to see where it's at, it's like it's been 15 minutes. I'm checking, and the guy's you know like he's he's still he's still two miles away. I mean, how how is this, how is this possible? I mean, my Five Guys and Fries incredibly nutritious meal you know is going to be cold, and then you know I'm like wondering now you know why did I do it in the first place? Uh, well, I'll be wondering after I eat it as well, but. Uh, but then there's like, you know, this like, you know, the stoplight can't be that long, right? You ever been in a situation where the Uber Eats driver has canceled on you and you're like, no, you didn't do that to me. Ever been there? Is that situation? No, I'm just, all right, by myself. Okay, we see one. What well, sold to the lady in the back. Uh, well, there's this, uh, you know, when, when what you order isn't delivered, you know, there is frustration. Comparison never delivers. Comparison never delivers. In comparison, in this kind of envious comparison, we're looking at somebody else thinking that if I just had what they had, then everything would be right for me. And when we get there, we find out that it actually never delivers on its promises. Ecclesiastes uh, verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 4, reads, starts like this. And I saw, this is a guy named Solomon, who is one of the kings of Israel. And he's like, he's reaching kind of an old age at this point in his life. And he's looking around at his own life, his own decisions that he'd made, and everything he sees around him. And he's kind of like taking note of things. And he says, and I saw that all toil and all achievement spring from one person's envy of another. This too is meaningless. 
Whoa, Solomon, chill. At chasing after the wind, fools fold their hands and ruin themselves. There he's talking about uh, people that don't work. They're just kind of, they're just taking, they're not giving, they're not producing, they're just folding their hands. He's saying this is a, a careless mentality like we've been talking about. Fools fold their hands, but then he goes to the other side. Uh, better one handful with tranquility than two handfuls with toil. He sees it's foolishness, one, to fold your hands and not work. And then all, it's also foolishness to be so fixed on work that you can't see anything else. And he says, this is a chasing after the wind. Now, all this talk about chasing after the wind and toil and meaninglessness, it sounds a little bit like an existential emo breakup song, but Solomon sees something that's incredibly important. And we're gonna be looking at three words in these verses that help us understand what Solomon is getting at um, in a really clear way. And the first is this word meaninglessness. Meaningless. Meaning, it's one of Solomon's favorite words. If you read through Ecclesiastes, you see it's almost like repeated. It's like a refrain. It's like the chorus in a song. He just keeps on saying meaningless, meaningless, meaningless. Which is just like, gee, Solomon. All right, okay, well, what, you know, what is meaningful then, Solomon? Tell me. The Hebrew word for this is fascinating. It is haval, and it means vapor. So every time you read Ecclesiastes, you can just read, when he says meaningless, you can just read vapor, mist. Every morning I, I wake up and I've got one of those automated coffee makers. I moved away from the pour over because I was, for a long time I was trying to be cool and have a pour over. Do you know what I'm talking I'm like, But it takes so long. I'm like, I don't love coffee this much. I love it, drinking it. I don't love just going like this. So I bought a, we bought a timed thing. It was, I think it was probably, you know, a rite of passage when you turn 40. You're just like, I'm not going to try to be a cool hipster guy anymore. I'm just going to get my coffee and start drinking it. So um, in the morning, you know, I've got my coffee there and there's this mist that comes out of the coffee. It comes out. And if it's not there, you microwave it and then it comes back again. It's magic. <laughs> it's crazy how that works out. Got no shame with coffee, guys. Microwave it, whatever. Three days later, still put it in there. <laughs> you know, it's like, I've never mistaken the mist, the vapor coming out of that for the coffee. It's, I've never chased after, oh, this guy, oh, give me a little bit of that. I've never done that. Especially if it's like a day old and microwaved. I'm not chasing after those fumes, you know. I'm drinking it like this. Uh, but like, this is what we, this is what Solomon's saying. We do this with stuff. He goes, it's all, it's vapor. It's meaningless. It's like a mist. And y'all are chasing it after it like it's the substance, like it's the real thing. It never delivers is what he's saying. It never delivers what it's promises. The products never deliver. Now it is, um, it is, uh, it's tricky because in our blessed consumer oriented economy, we are just so good at putting out another product. And so it's like, we get something thinking the promise is gonna deliver, you know? Red Bull is gonna give me wings this time, but it just, it just keeps giving me a stomach ache and some jittery arms, you know? And, and then all of a sudden we realize it didn't make good on its promises, but then there's a new thing in front of us. Oh, but if we get this, this thing's gonna do it. And it keeps us on this conveyor belt where we just keep thinking the next thing. The next word is toil. So vapor and toil. And it's like this, it's like toil the word in Hebrew, it's not like good work. It's not like I feel satisfied with this and I'm contributing to something. I'm bringing home a paycheck. Toil is like this. I can't take my hands off this thing. It, it means pain and heartache. He's saying like a cha it's this chasing after the wind, vaporous pursuit that only brings you heartache. That's what envy does. Why? Because if you remember, as we mentioned at the beginning, envy is this belief that there is something in me that is not enough and is only answered if I have what's out there. Then he goes, what better is somebody with tranquility in one hand and work in the other hand? Because this, this sounds like a balanced life, you know? I'm not folding my hands and, and keeping myself from work. I'm not working with both my, I'm, 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 I've got tranquility, I've got peace in one hand and I've got work in the other. I'm balancing it out. You know, um, an absence of comparison creates peace. An absence of corrupt comparison creates peace. 
Because when I'm not, when I stop the comparison game, when I stop the envy game, when I stop that, I I no longer am believing the lie that if I just grind a little bit more, then all my soul needs will be satisfied. I'm, I'm, I'm not believing that lie anymore. I'm not believing the lie that they have it all and I don't have it. If I get like them, then I'll have it. I stop believing that lie so I can actually have one handful of rest and tranquility. It's like, this is an aspiration to have one handful of rest. This is what Solomon's telling us. To one handful of rest, one handful of peace. And peace happens when there is an absence of com- comparison. I love this passage in Psalm 16, Psalms, these like poems written by, a lot of them written by David to God and, and about faith. And Psalm 16, verses five and six says, Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. David's saying here is like, if everything was taken away, like if you like, if you just stripped, if you just pruned me, God, of everything, I still would have enough because you are my portion. You are my cup. Anybody want to pray that prayer or say that prayer? It's a bold prayer. You alone are my portion. You are my cup. You make my lot secure. And then I love this, this verse, the boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. He's looking at his life and he's not looking at somebody else. He's looking at his life and he goes, the where I'm at, what I've been given, this is pleasant. I've got, I've got enough and I'm good. This is what David is saying. And he goes, surely I have a delightful inheritance. This is that one hand in tranquility, one hand in work approach to life where I'm not bent around constant movement, toil, pursuing vapor because I'm envying another, but I know that I'm enough because God is enough, right? The envy game has one part of it right. It says that by myself, I'm not enough. That's, that's kind of right. But Pascal, the mathematician, maybe you've heard of him, he said that all of us have a God-shaped vacuum within us that is only filled by God. And the world runs after all these things, trying to fill that thing with other things. But if with God, I'm enough. It's a beautiful thing to kind of center ourselves. In fact, I just want to encourage all of us, you know, just engage in this, maybe this, this week, when you find yourself tempted to compare when you got that phone out and you're scrolling through and you're seeing all these people with blue hashtags with expensive things, looking all pretty, being all smart and all that kind of stuff, all of a sudden put that down, drop that, and then look around you. Like literally like look around you and count the things you're thankful for. Count the things you're thankful for. He has made, he has put my boundary lines in pleasant places. I have enough because he's enough. Next thing we see as we go forward in this passage is that comparison kills joy. It's a lie. It's a, it's a lie is that if you, just, if you just get one more thing, then the joy will happen. Comparison kills joy. Verse seven, again, I saw something meaningless under the sun. Solomon, you're after one. Again, I saw something vaporous, something misty under the sun. There was a man all alone. He had neither son nor brother. There was no end to his toil, yet his eyes were not content, wow, with his wealth. For I am, for whom am I toiling, he asked. And why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This too is, a, is meaningless, a miserable business. I love that, it's a miserable business. I get the sense of like, um, you know, like you've watched this movie, right? Haven't you watched this movie? Where like three quarters of the way through the movie, the guy's out on his, in his penthouse suite. He's looking around and he's seeing all his toys and all his stuff that he's accumulated and he's seeing an empty home. And he's like, where's my son? Where's my brother? Where's my family? Where's the people that, oh. Comparison keeps us from appreciation of our present. Comparison keeps us from appreciating our present. Ecclesiastes shows us the fruit of this, that a person that is two hands of toil ends up with vapor in his hands. Think about this, how this works out. You see, if this is where I'm, where I'm at, you're like, yep, that's Brian. That's literally where you are at. And that's physically where you're at. But if this is like metaphorically where I'm at, this is 
this is my family, this is the, my friend group, this is where I'm living, this is where I'm at, and all of my energy and attention is over here, where somebody else is at, where what they have, and their people, and their family, and their friends, and I'm, if, I, if I'm constantly comparing over here, where does that take me? It literally takes me out of the present where I'm at. And so all of my energy and attention is over here. And so if I spend all of my energy and all of my attention over here, where I literally am not at, what am I missing out on? I'm missing out on the, the place that I'm at with the people that, I, that are around me, my family and my friends. Not only that, but am I not only missing out on my family and my friends, but I'm missing out on what God's wanting to do with me in the moment. You see, if I'm taking myself out of where I'm at, then I'm missing out of what God wants to do with me in the moment. Because God can only work with the real you, right? The real you that is actually here. He can't work with the imagined, aspiring, pursuing whoever this is type of person that's comparing himself. He can't, he can't work. He can only work with the real you in the real moment. And so the what Solomon is describing is a person who's give all of his attention over here and not present right here where the person actually is. He, he, at the end of his life, and this is kind of that point in the movie, he's looking back and goes, wait, everybody's left. They may still live in the house, but they're emotionally and relationally distant because I've been spending all of my energy and my, my time and my affection outside of myself. And the challenging lesson there is that looks like comparison killed joy. This is how Jesus describes it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Think about the whole world for a second. You got everything from, you know, private islands to pyramids to all the money and you could imagine the whole world. What, but, but what good would it be for it to gain the whole stinking world? I inserted that, stinking. Yet forfeit their soul. Oof. Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? There's two types of um, comparison that kill our joy. There's that grit and hustle comparison that I've been talking about so far. But then there's also, can I just say, and this is something that a lot of us wrestle with, maybe even more often, it's what I would call self-defeat comparison. You ever wrestle with that? It's okay that you're not saying you have. I know you have. <laughs> self-defeat comparison. Where you're, you're looking over there and you say, well, I'm not going to even try. Why would I even want to grow in the gifts that God has given me? Because they're not like that one. Why would I even want to try to, to work towards developing a savings account and towards my retirement? Because I'm never going to be like that. So you defeat yourself before. And the, it's because why? Because you're comparing yourself to someone else rather than listening to what God is saying to you. God's saying, hey, I have given you gifts to grow in. I have given put people around you that love you or at least like, like you, you know. I have given you things. I have put your boundary lines in pleasant places. A counselor friend of mine um, says sometimes with people that are dealing with uh, high levels of anxiety in the counseling um, room or, or maybe or in their own life, they give them this practical tool where they say, look around you, and this is kind of similar to that thankfulness practice, look around you and take note of the things that are actually in the room. And that grounds you back in the present moment. A lot of times, you know, um, when we're in that self-defeat comparison or the hustle and grind comparison, we're, we're like this guy over here that I described. You're looking, you're like, you're put, taking yourself out of the room. You have to just like count the things, count five things you're thankful for, count five things that are in your life and that's the place where God has placed you, where God wants to work on your life. Here's the, here's the, Solomon gets to the good news eventually. He gets to the good news. You could describe the next uh, three or four verses with this community defeats comparison. Community defeats comparison. And by community, I don't mean like um, a group of people that happen to share the a last name by by some accident of geography and biology, um, nor do I mean a people that work at the same place and they, 
their checks all say the same company. Uh, I, don't, I don't necessarily mean even just people that happen to be the same room on a Sunday morning. I'm, I'm talking about like something that like real, like actual community, not just a crowd, but a community. There's a difference there. From, from far back, it looks like the same thing, but look closer and you find something different. Here's what a community is. A community is when I know your name, but then it goes farther. I know your story. I know your brokenness. I know something of your giftedness. I know something of your sin struggles. I know something of your aspirations. And when I, when I know that about a person, maybe not totally all the way, but I start to know that about a person, I have a friend. When I know that about three or five people, I've got a community, the beginnings of a community, right? This is why we talk about anchor groups because we think this is really good what's happening here, but we need a smaller group of people that you can actually be in real life community with. This is why we love Celebrate Recovery because it creates, yeah, woo, woo. Let's get some woo in here, come on. Because it creates an environment where people come in and they are real and they're opening their lives and saying, I wanna follow Jesus and I need you to help me. This is, this is where community is formed and founded. And community defeats comparison. Why? Because check this out. Comparison divides. It's looking as somebody is either greater or lesser than, and I want to either be better than uh, or, or, you know, or, or whatever. I'm looking at how I... It, commun, com, comparison always divides. Community unites. In community, I find out that you might be in a different income bracket. You might you know, look good to whatever the world script is on what looks good in the moment. You might whatever, whatever, whatever. But turns out, you still have struggles. You still have areas that are unpolished. The Instagram filter won't fix that. We're all on that same thing. A community brings us that into that reality. It unites rather than divides. And this is what we see as, as uh, Solomon goes on in verse nine. He says, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. Uh, he's talking about partnership here. You see, the ambition that's rooted in envy and, and, and comparison, you can never have true partnership in life because you're always trying to outdo somebody. But here, it's like when you work together, when you're yoked together, you actually grow more of what you're working on and you get a share in it with someone else. Partnership. Compassion, as we look in verse 10, it talks about compassion. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up, but pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Compassion. If you're always trying to be better than somebody else, the only but person that's going to be around you are the yes men. But if you're, if you're in community, people are going to reach down and pick you up when you fall. Connection in verse 11. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Solomon's like, this is a cold world. People with, with, with cold things. And we need people to bring warmth into our life. So we're not just all alone. And the next is protection. Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands, that's God, you, and the person you're in community with, is, is not quickly broken. I don't know about you, um, but like when I think about like this community thing as the antidote to comparison, like I think like, oh man, it doesn't come naturally. Community, that type of community, like partnership, compassion, connection, protection, that doesn't come naturally. If it did, this world would look different, let's be honest. Instead of the polarizing, kind of like backbiting world that was populating our newsfeed, we would have a different world if community came naturally. So how do we, as a community that is following Jesus together, how do we find, how do we be people of actual community as Solomon is articulating there so that the community, community can defeat comparison and we can be a radiant, different, beautiful community to a world that's kind of still on that conveyor. But how do we do that? We have to understand that Jesus Christ, before anything else, sought out to be in community with us. That Jesus Christ 
sought out to be in community with us by taking on the form of a child. This is like Jesus is, 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 is God and he comes, and a ch- why, why would he do that? It's because he loves you so much that he would experience his own vulnerability so that you might be brought into connection with God so that the difference, the gulf between you and God might not stand as a gaping gap keeping you from community, but that Jesus Christ was born and then he died so that we might be brought into relationship with him. And when we know that he wants to be in community with you so much that he endured the greatest loss anyone could imagine his own life so that you might be brought into community with the holy God when you understand that, that he wants to be in partnership with you, that he wants to be in connection with you, that he wants to give you his compassion, that he wants to be your advocate and protect you. When you understand that, that that you haven't done anything to earn it, but it's given freely to you when you understand that he wants to be in community with you. You can look out into the world and say, I'm free from comparison. I'm free from comparison. I'm free. I don't have to do it. I know the need that is in my soul has been filled by the all-powerful, just generous God so that I can give out to others and be in community, in community. And then comparison's defeated. The band can come up and those helping with communion and prayer can come forward. Um, Guys, check this out. This is why we do communion every week because we think like if, as we're planning our gatherings and thinking about it, it's like, what do we want to be really clear? (laughs) We want to be really clear that the God of the universe like loves you so much that he poured out his life on on, on your behalf for your sake. And then so that every week we are reminded of that by like, like these practical, tangible things like, like, like these little wafers and some juice. Why would we do that? Why would we eat these wafers and juice? It doesn't taste that good. Let's be honest. We eat it because we're reminded that this is just a very small glimpse of the love of God, of the just overwhelming, never ending, pursuing love of God so that we can get off that conveyor belt that says, go, 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 go. Another product, another promise. Try to look good as them. Try to be smart as them. Try to do it all. So we struggle with grit and hustle, self-defeat so we can get off that whole paradigm, that get off that conveyor belt and just live in this sense of knowing that I am love and my boundary lines are secure because Jesus paid it all. And so I'm a recipient of all and I can walk in that freedom. That's why you hear these words when you come up for communion. Christ's body given for what? You. Christ's blood shed for who? You. You. Let me just tell you, if you're not a Jesus follower here, you were invited to become one to get off the conveyor belt the world has put you on and say, no, I'm not going to play the comparison game again. I'm not going to get on that track. I'm going to be and receive the love of God and the forgiveness of God that meets me right where I'm at. It's not waiting for me to clean myself up. It meets me right where I'm at. You are invited to be a recipient of that and to take communion for the first time as a follower of Jesus. I know there's people in here that need prayer and I, I just would say, would you be courageous with me? Would you be courageous with that prayer request that, that you know that you have? Would you come to one of these prayer stations and say, hey, raise your hand, I need prayer. There's people that are safe that wanna pray with you. We're gonna sing a couple more songs that will tune our hearts to the truth of God. So I invite us to stand. You can come forward for communion whenever you're willing, whenever you desire. And pray with you. Presence of the Holy God, would you meet us in this place? Spirit of the whole of, of God, would you meet us in this place? Help us, all of us, in this, to step off the conveyor belt. To be a recipient, to receive and welcome your love. There's no need for comparison. I, I hear you saying, I hear you saying, there's no need for comparison. Some of us in here need to be reminded, there's no need for comparison. Because you, because you have given us yourself. Help us to know that. We pray in the powerful name of Jesus.